In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a cradle Catholic who was raised in Memphis, Tennessee. His parents divorced when he was only 13, and he soon began to medicate with drugs and alcohol, dropping out of high school at age 16. But at age 18, our guest entered into recovery and began his faith journey back to God and eventually home to the Catholic faith. Like everyone else in this series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Clint Stonebreaker. Clint, we welcome you to our home and we welcome you to our show. Thank you very much, I'm glad to be here. I'd love to hear about your childhood, where you grew up, your family dynamics. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, uh, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, ah. and uh, I'm one of four kids. But I grew up in, in the church. Catholic church? Catholic church, awesome. yes. Up until around eighth grade, 13, 13 oh. or so. What happened in eighth grade that caused you to lose your faith or walk away from it? Well, actually, my faith was really important to me as a, as a child, and there were a few people that had a, a pretty significant impact on me early on. At one of my elementary schools, there was a priest there named Father Pugh who was very influential for me. During my childhood, my parents' marriage was, was somewhat strained. Home life was pretty difficult. Uh, my father uh, is an alcoholic, and, uh, and it, was, it was pretty, pretty hard. So for me, as I got older and my parents grew further apart, they divorced when, uh, again, when I was in eighth grade. And that led to a series of events that uh, I eventually moved in with my father, moved to Texas, and, and stopped practicing my faith then. When you stopped uh, the faith, was it, what was your main rationale by not pursuing God during some difficult times? You know, at the time, I didn't really think about it that much. Uh, my father wasn't nearly as faithful as my mother. Ah, so if he didn't go, you didn't go. If he didn't go, I didn't go. Yeah. And by the time we moved to Texas, I had discovered uh, drugs and alcohol oh. and went in, in a very different direction than what I'd originally grown up in. And you spiraled pretty deeply enough to change your high school path even, didn't you? Definitely, um, very deeply and very quickly. In Texas, because it was just me and my father, the, the family was you know, obviously broken apart. Uh, my three siblings went with my mother, I went with my father. So through my late junior high years and early high school years, I was a good enough student to hold it together eighth and ninth grade. Uh, by the time the 10th grade rolled around, the, the bottom fell out because it required more work. Yeah. And I was far more interested in partying and, and all of that than I was in scholastics. The other thing that was a problem too was due to my father's and my lifestyle, I was alone a lot. Uh, and No you know, accountability. No accountability at, at all. Um, and that, that led to a lot of isolation, but it also led to a lot of being motivated by peer pressure more than the norm, I would say, uh, because that's, that's who I ran to for security. Sure. So rather than God or, or a healthy peer group, I had drugs and alcohol and an unhealthy peer group. How did that affect your high school life? Big time. Um, by the time uh, the 10th grade rolled around, I kind of squeezed through the, the ninth grade. 10th grade rolled around and I realized that it was gonna require a lot more hard work, which again, the, 
the better part of my life, I was a good student. Right. Uh, when hard work needed to be applied. Uh, and the drugs and alcohol drugs were and playing alcohol. a part in this. E exactly. It was not a combination that worked. No, it was not. And I wound up dropping out of high school. At what age? Uh, 16. Age 16, you dropped out of high school. Dropped out of high school. I didn't know you could legally do that. <laughs> yeah, I could. And, and in fact, it, things got so bad um, for my father and my stepmother, I wound up being emancipated, which I wow. suppose in the state of Texas is possible. Well, tell us what that means. To be emancipated is to be made a legal adult before adult age. So wow. when I was 17, I was either still 16 or 17, uh, my father went to went to court and yeah. had me emancipated. So you were on your own as a very young child. Yes, I was. Wow, what happened next in your life? Well, uh, after after that, and I was kindly asked to leave the home, um, I find that easier to say than getting kicked out. Because yeah. really, it, in fairness, my, my father's life had straightened out, and he he tried for for months to, to get me help, right. and I refused. I just, yeah. Over and over and over you again. You weren't ready yet. I was not ready. So after the emancipation, he gave me some, uh, some choices, and I chose to leave. Uh, so I moved in with some, some friends of mine uh, whose mother also was a, was a pretty heavy drug user because I knew, again, I'd gotten comfortable with the idea of no accountability to anyone yeah. or to so anything. So that environment was ideal for Perfect. you. You had no one to answer Perfect to. Perfect for me. Coming up, you'll find out what twists and turns Clint's faith journey will take next. The Nicene Creed uh, it really hit home, and, and that's, that's what really brought me back into a conscious awareness that this is my relationship with God. I'm in a good place in my life. And I'm energized by new adventures. I've got friends to laugh with. And a good relationship. But even though I'm kind of comfortable? I sometimes wonder, is there something more? Could God and church be what you're looking for? Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. So at age 16, you're living on your own, moving in with friends and their mother who was also a drug user. Yes using drugs and alcohol, and your life had spun out of control, where you had the responsibilities of an adult, but you weren't taking them to heart and you were just doing your own thing. Yes. How did your life take a turn for the better? Uh, well, going back to my, my father, the choice he had given me was to go and visit with a counselor and mm -hmm. talk about my problem or to, or to leave. I chose to leave. Uh, things fell apart at the place that I was living, and I was asked to leave there too. I mean, wow. how you managed to pull that <laughs> off, I'm not sure, but I did. And I called my, my father because there was nowhere else for me to turn. Homelessness was not a viable option for me. And he said it, it was kind of like the prodigal child returning because what yeah. he said to me was, I would love nothing more for you to come home, but you've got to understand the deal that we had when you left still stands. Yes. And at that point, I was Good desperate enough to To, to, to take the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the deal was to get clean and sober to get clean in order to live in his, under his roof. Exactly. And how did that happen? So initially I went and saw a counselor who referred me to some meetings. I started going to 12-step meetings Good. And, uh, and it worked. Uh, and that age was what, 18? 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it worked for you. And then how did your life then proceed in a good direction where you've maybe found faith or established relationships? Sure. So through, uh, through my recovery program, I made the decision that I wanted to be a counselor myself because I received so much help from some really, really good people. And I entered into a counselor training program. Oh, neat. Uh, became certified as a drug and alcohol abuse counselor. And through the years, met several people who were very, very helpful uh, to me in, in numerous ways, both, both in my recovery and in my spirituality. I have a question about your recovery in the 12-step. What was the one thing you remember as a catalyst that changed you from being addicted to drugs and alcohol to giving you that freedom? And what, what is that one critical thing? Because so many of our viewers either have that challenge themselves or they have children who have that challenge. Definitely. I, I'm interested to hear what the catalyst was for your life. Uh, definitely. Turning my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him, so without a doubt. You discovered God, probably I was gonna say rediscovered, but was He ever a part of your childhood or did you kind of discover Him for the first time? No, in fact, my relationship with God as a child was extremely important to mm. me. And 
the rediscovery was actually more impactful because I had enough life experience at that point to realize what I had thrown away. Yeah. Did you come back to the Catholic Church? It took a long time to come back to the Catholic Tell Church. Tell us about that journey. So through my recovery, my relationship with God grew. Okay, so I felt reconnected. And spiritually, I felt very connected. Sure. When actually about eight or nine years ago, I started to feel a strong, strong pull uh, back to the church. And it would, it would happen through simple things, driving by a church and feeling a tug. Yeah. Um, seeing a, a priest on a movie and feeling a tug. Yes. You know, it could be all, it was all kinds of things. And eventually I decided, you know, I'm gonna go to mass. So I asked mm -hmm. my daughter who was um, at the time You say daughter, 12. so by this time you had met a woman, got yes, married. Yes, got married. You have a child, have a, a child, daughter. Yes. Okay. And uh, one of my other friends, I invited them to go to mass with me on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we went and it was, it was a sense of palpable relief. You know? So you I invited a friend fun. because it was easier going with somebody yes, than going alone. Definitely. So the first time back, you went with a friend. Exactly. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. And tell us about that experience. What did you feel? What did you realize? What epiphany did you have at that first mass when you returned? Well, every you know the sights and sounds for me really drew me back mm. in. Looking around and noticing the crucifix. That's what I got fixated on was the crucifix, and the Nicene Creed mm -hmm. uh, it really hit home. And, and that's that's what really brought me back into a conscious awareness that this is my relationship with God. What specifically about the crucifix touched you? The sacrifice, uh, Christ's Christ sacrifice, sacrifice for, uh, for, for the, the sins, sins of all mankind. Including you including and including me. me. Including all of us, definitely. And you felt that mercy that he, you knew your life had changed and you kind of said, I need to be doing something else. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How did your return to faith in the Catholic Church then affect your daughter and your wife? Interesting. So that was 2012 that I came back, came fully into uh, into the church. The next year, my daughter went through the RCIC program uh -huh. and uh, received the sacraments in 2013. So that's like RCIA prep, but for younger exactly, people. Exactly, for younger people. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my wife came into the church in 2015. Oh, praise God. And how has your family changed now that the whole family's back in the church? Uh, immensely. Well, for, for one, our spirituality is far more shared than it ever was. Yeah. Um, and it's not that our spirituality was uh, was a closed topic or but anything it's more like private, that. private, now it's a family. Exactly. Now we, now we you participate. You have something in common to share with each other and relate to and discuss. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the blessings that we've received uh, is uh, last year, um, my wife and I had another baby. Oh, uh, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Uh, a boy or a girl? A boy, Oh, Daniel. good, good for you. And uh, in, in that, that we truly see, we know, is, is a blessing from God. How many years apart are your daughter and your son? My daughter is now 20. My son just turned one on Sunday. Wow. Well, we praise God for that, that you're open to life. But I know in a sense you, you cheated a little bit because you have a built-in babysitter in that 20-year-old. That's, <laughs> that's true. Good point. Yeah, good that's point. okay. Hey, it's all good. What are some of the things that you know about God and faith now that you may have known as a young child but kind of forgot when you started getting into substance abuse? Uh, well, I mean, really a lot because the the relationship with God that I had as a child is far different as a, as an adult. Yeah. There's a lot less fear on my part. I, I understand God's mercy. Yes. I understand um, God's love. Um, I understand the the value of sharing my faith with others yes. uh, far more than I ever did. And, and really my relationship with God as an adult is more of a living relationship. More mature. As, yeah, exactly. As a child, I, I think it was more passive. Yeah, and you thought of God as kind of the big guy up there who judged and exactly. marked off a checklist. And now you see him as the loving, merciful father that he is. That, that I have a relationship with, yes. for sure. And you then share that with others who may not know that. Exactly. Yeah, we, we say in uh, uh, one of our evangelicals, uh, I think our movie one, where Christ didn't come to condemn the world, he came to save, save it. it yeah. Because so many people think of that Jansenistic image of God that he's got a checklist and he's looking for what you're going to do wrong and make note of it. When really he sent his son Jesus to save 
save us and to say, hey, I died for your sins. All you have to do is repent and come home to me and it all gets better, that divine mercy of Jesus. No doubt. You actually started, not only studied this to be a counselor and help other people with addictions, but you actually started your own apostolate that helps people with it. What's that all about? So uh, Father John uh, Bonav Bonavita Cola, mm -hmm. uh, who is a priest in Phoenix, it started a, a, a program, a ministry through his church, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. In Tempe, Arizona. In Tempe, Arizona. And I grew up out there. I lived out there. I know him well. I know that parish well. Great, so. great. Here at Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yep. he started a ministry for troubled youth yes. uh, called, called Full Circle. And of course, when we talk about troubled youth, a lot of that centers around drug and alcohol abuse and yes. other addictions. Of course. And he invited me to be a, a, a part of that. And, and really, we, the genesis of it, um, I was able to participate in because I lived in Phoenix at the time. Okay. Little did I know later on, that was going to, that was before I re-entered the, the church. And, and I think that was actually a, a critical moment in that yeah. too. Uh, but Full Circle has been great. And to be able to share both my professional experience along with my faith journey in a way that's helping kids and helping families is phenomenal and, and again I know that that's a blessing of God. I know that so many families today and so many Catholic families are looking for answers for their children. Their children are cutting or they're hooked on drugs or alcohol or pornography or they're depressed. They don't know where to turn. Full Circle is in a lot of Catholic uh, venues now around the United States and is a great resource for those tools for them isn't it? Without a doubt. And, and really, you know, what it, what it comes down to, 12-step recovery, in my opinion, is, is very Catholic when you look at it. Yeah. And when, when you combine the, the wisdom of 12-step recovery, which has been effective for a very long time, uh, with the, the, the overarching wisdom of the Catholic Church, which has been around for far longer, <laughs> I think the presentation of it for young people is something that they that they can relate to very very well, and you know, it, to me one of the one of the biggest issues that young people have today is a spirituality that that's devoid of meaning. Um, in other words, there's not the same emphasis or or meat to it. They don't, they don't want the routine and all. They want authentic relationship exactly. with God, and they want to see it through authentic witnesses exactly. of us. Exactly. Exactly. And really, you know, one of the things that we've discovered is that through some really tragic stories of suffering and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, people are able to find immense joy. And when they're able to share that with others, miracles happen. In our conclusion, you'll discover what fuels Clint's faith now. Jesus truly does love me and that mercy is available to me and to anyone who seeks it out at any time in their life. We are a young and diverse generation, helping those in need and promoting human rights. We care for the environment. We embrace authentic witnesses and dream of a better world. Our passion comes from God, who loves us even when we fall and cheers on our victories. If you sometimes wonder, is there something more? Then come and see at catholicscomehome.com. Clint, I thank God because now you and your family have a life centered on Christ. You're using the uh, past of being addicted to drugs and alcohol having studied that to do that as a profession and now bringing it full circle in a ministry called Full Circle to help other troubled youth to find Jesus and find hope in their lives and, and some answers for their parents, praise God. We, we thank God for that and we thank you for serving in that area and your family supporting you. We thank you for being open to life and having another son after 20 years from having yes. your daughter. God bless you and your wife, that's awesome. <laughs> we're, we're thankful for your pro-life heart. What brings you closer to God now? What devotions do you have? What saints are uh, part of your life? Well, de there, there are a lot of devotions. One, one thing that, um, that I discovered that, that really helps me is the, the liturgy of the hours. Um, I, I love the discipline uh, and I love the repetition of the Psalms. Um, I'm a daily rosary prayer that's very important to me and my devotion to the Blessed Mother is, is essential in my life. 
Uh, Padre Pio has been uh, a, a very large influence. Um, we actually got to visit um, San Giovanni Rotondo a few years ago, mm. uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me was his life of service, even from his role as a monk, uh, the way that he helped tr troubled kids. Yeah. Um, St. Philip Neri is a big, is a mm -hmm. big influence. Uh, Thomas Merton is a big influence. Yes. Uh, so they're, they're, I've been able to discover a lot of great inspirations uh, through, the, through the years that have contributed mightily to my spirituality. And those saints are the MVPs, the most valuable players who went before us, and, <laughs> yes. and they know how it is, and they're guiding it's us so along true. the way. We should have saint trading cards, you know, so that young people could say, hey, this is my hero. Real heroes. I, I want to be on the team, you know, to serve Jesus that way. How do you feel now you can talk to young people and help them in Full Circle Ministry? And I should say, by the way, uh, I served on the board of Full Circle for a number of years. It was an honor for me to do that. I found nothing but joy out of that and uh, was so impressed with the organization. And I know Father John Bonavitacola very well. In fact, our audience would know him because he starred in our epic commercial. However, he was photobombed by Jesus because when he held up the monstrance, Jesus and the monstrance blocked him out of having full face uh, exposure in his starring role in that commercial. So the joke is that uh, Father Bonavitacola was upstaged by Jesus in the uh, world-renowned epic spot. Um, but nonetheless, it was great to have him in that. That's right. Um, how do you help young people with these devotions to saints, your devotion to the rosary? What things can you share with them now that help pull them out of those troubled uh, spots and give them more hope and give them Jesus as the answer? Sure, I think the most important thing is to lead with love and, and to reach them where they are. I think a lot of times, the mistake that people make in working with young people is expecting them to be at a place that they're not yet capable of being. Yeah. Too uh, much too soon. Too much too soon, certainly. Yeah. And when, when you lead with love and reach them where they are, um, teenagers are very open to, yeah. uh, to uh, discovering new ways to, uh, new people to model their life after. And, and new ways of finding happiness. Yes. And the church is a great place, I think, for young people to find that absolute joy and love and mercy uh, that's so essential to, to a healthy spiritual life. Well, I, we would all agree with you, especially the Adoration Chapel, Definitely. Uh, the beautiful sacraments we have, the sacramentals, the sense of community. And it's so important for millennials and younger people now. We developed a website called catholicscomehome.com, not the traditional .org that most of our viewers know about, specifically to help young people in vernacular and language they understand. Why is it important to talk to young people in their language and meet them where they are? Because that, that point of life is so awkward, for one. And I think a lot of times adults lose sight of how strange that period of life truly is. You're between worlds. You're not a child anymore. You're not yet an adult. And when you drifted, it was bad enough. Nowadays, there's even more pressures on young way people. Way scarier than yeah. it was in the 80s, definitely. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned, though, that I wanted to, to touch on just for a second, because I think it's really important, you had mentioned uh, the Adoration Chapel. Yeah. Uh, many young people who are fallen away Catholics, uh, one thing that almost every one of them has in common is their love for the Adoration Chapel. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, I, I, I think it makes sense. There's so much noise in our world, and I'm a communication guy in advertising, that we don't force ourselves to take that time to hear God's small voice, to expose ourselves to that silence that brings us peace. And when we do, we have an epiphany of faith, like, oh my gosh, God's alive and well and He's talking to me. I've just been surrounded by all these stimuli so long I haven't heard them. That's right. Uh, so when we block that out and we find that peace, um, uh, we're, we get addicted That's to right. Jesus in the Adoration Chapel That's in right. the Blessed Sacrament. We're at the end of our show, so I'll ask you this. What do you know now that you didn't know back then as a teenager about God and about life? That Jesus truly does love me and that mercy is available to me and to anyone who seeks it out at any time in their life. Praise God. Clint, welcome home. Thank you. Our culture tells us that we are valuable because of what we do. It speaks to our senses every moment of every day, telling us we need to do more. 
Our worth is based on what we accomplish, how we achieve, the number of hours we put in at the office, how much we make and how much we spend, and what we cross off our life's to-do lists. God tells us we are valuable because of who we are. He whispers in our hearts every moment of every day that He loves us because we are His. We are valuable because we are man, created in His image. Our worth is based on who we become, how conformed we can be to His will, and the person He created us to be. The time we spend just being with Him in prayer, how we love, what we cross off our life's to-be list, ultimately to be a saint. Here are some strategies for focusing more on being than doing. First, sit. Just sit in God's presence. Sometime this week, go to the Adoration Chapel, your parish's sanctuary or a quiet place in your home and just sit and be with God. You can read or do other action-oriented things in prayer later, but to start, just spend time in silence with God. Next, pick a virtue to grow in this week. Virtues help us become the people God desires us to be, the kind of people that will make us truly content and at peace with ourselves. Pick a virtue, charity, generosity, patience, trust, faith, hope, prudence, fortitude, that you will focus on this week to help you take one step closer to being a saintly person. Next, cross off an item on your to-do list. Look at your likely expansive lists of things to do this week and determine if there is anything that can wait. Make a little more margin for rest this week. John 16, says, I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Here's your chance to get active in the new evangelization. Visit the catholicscomehome.org website and click on the shop tab. Here, you can order a Catholics Come Home book, evangelization cards, a DVD of the Evangemercials, or a car magnet. If you or someone you know has come home to the church thanks in part to Catholics Come Home, let us know. Or if you have a comment, question, or want to support our mission, email us at info at catholicscomehome.org or write to us at Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia, 30077. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. During his teens, Clint medicated with drugs and alcohol to mask the pain of his parents' divorce. But after recovery, Clint would restart his faith journey and soon meet the woman who would become his wife. Within a few years, Clint returned to his Catholic faith and soon his young wife and two children entered the church. Now the Stonebreakers are a close family, united in their Catholic faith. The Holy Spirit inspired Clint to start and manage Full Circle, a nationwide Catholic rehabilitation ministry that helps young adults fighting addictions. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Clint and the Stonebreaker family in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven.